All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we go with the properties of solutions. This is a, a minor chapter. This is not uh, vitally important uh, for everything on the AP exam. However, there's a couple of equations in here, a couple of conversions, practicing, that kind of stuff that is, uh, that is useful. So <clears throat> let's begin. This is chapter 13 of the Brown book, chapter 11 of the OpenStax book. So this is uh, a stepwise process of dissolving something. So this is showing you an energy diagram of the process of dissolving things. Okay, so if you have a net um, exothermic process, um, you're starting with your uh, solvent particles and your solute particles, because remember when you make a solution, it is a solute being dissolved in a solvent, right? So those solute particles and solvent particles must separate from each other in, in theory, right? And so it always takes um, energy in order to do that. So you have your solute and your solvent, right, sitting out here. And then the first step is that you separate the solute particles and then you separate the solvent particles, right? Uh, both of those require energy because you're taking particles that are closer together and you are separating them, right? Coulomb's law says that opposite charges attract like charges repel. The force is stronger the closer they are. So if you they have um, any intermolecular forces, uh, those intermolecular forces have to be, you know, broken so that they can be separated. And then in the final step, when they are mixed together, right, the separated solvent particles and the separated solute particles are mixed together, then that process, uh, because you are bringing particles closer together, they are able to interact more. So Coulomb's law says that process releases energy, right? So you could think of this as um, energy going in to kind of break attractions. This is energy going in to break attractions. And this is energy coming back out when those attractions are replaced, right, when they come back together. Um, in, the, in an endothermic process, uh, you have the same steps, right? You have your solvent and your solute. You got to separate them, separate them, and then bring them together. But when you bring them together, you don't gain as much energy as you had to put into it to separate those particles. And so this is an endothermic solution process, right? So you, most solution processes are exothermic. Most of them are um, because that process of bringing those separated solvent particles and separated solute particles together oftentimes, most oftentimes, releases energy, right? Releases more energy than you had to put in. But if that process does not release as much energy as you had to put in, then it is an uh, endothermic process. So this is the an illustration of that uh, process, right? So you have your solute packed all together, your solvent kind of packed all together. Um, the solvent, notice that is packed more loosely than the solute in the illustration. And that's on purpose because solute, solvent is typically a solution, right? It's a liquid. And so the liquid particles will be sliding past each other. The solute, typically a solid, and those particles are, are packed together nicely. So then when you expand them, you separate them out from each other, and then you mix them. Um, this, is the, this is the illustration of those steps. And so in that stepwise process, in that step one where you take your solute, solute, uh, intermolecular forces and you separate them, right? Separate the solute, you have to overcome the intermolecular forces there, right? And that requires energy. In step two, let me help you see this. No, no, no. There we go. There you go. So in step two, that solvent solvent intermolecular force must be overcome so that you can separate them, right? And then the solvation solute solvent attractive forces are established. That means that you take the solute, the solvent, they get closer together again and energy is released, right? Because you have um, more intermolecular forces being formed, okay? Now, here's a key uh, part of this. The golden rule of solubility is that like dissolves like. You can't say that on the AP exam, though. That's the guiding principle, right? But uh, the AP readers don't like that for some reason. Um, it's a generalization, right? And and we in chemistry don't like generalizations because we like to explain things in detail and be accurate. However, like dissolves like is, is often very accurate, like very, very often accurate. So what does this mean? Well, like dissolves like means that if you have, if you have nonpolar solvents 
they will dissolve nonpolar solutes. So if you have something that's nonpolar and you're trying to dissolve something else that's nonpolar, nonpolar things will work together, right? Because like dissolves like. It is actually because their intermolecular forces match. Okay, so if you have nonpolar solvents, their predominant um, intermolecular force is the London dispersion force. And when the London dispersion force is uh, simultaneously common to both the solute and the solvent, they tend to dissolve each other easier, right? Uh, whereas polar solvents tend to dissolve polar solutes because their primary intermolecular force is a dipole-dipole attraction or a hydrogen bond, right? Which is a particularly strong dipole-dipole attraction. And so if you have dipole-dipole attractions, they tend to um, mix well together, right? And if you, if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because there's little magnets in your uh, solute, little magnets in your solvent, and so the magnets will line up, right? And that's, that's the reason why like dissolves like is uh, a guiding statement. However, you can't ever say that, okay? So you can't write, this, is, this happens because like dissolves like. You have to say this dissolves because the solvent and the solute have very similar intermolecular forces and they are likely to be soluble in each other. So um, this is kind of a, a really key component uh, to solutions as well, is the idea of a saturated solution or an unsaturated solution. So saturated solutions are such that all of the solute particles that can be dissolved are dissolved. So all the spaces in the solution, in the solvent, that could be filled with solute particles are filled, right? Unsaturated means that not all of the solute particles that can be dissolved are dissolved, meaning that there are spaces, right, that are available for um, solute to be dissolved in a solvent. So try to draw that, right? Try drawing that out with little solute particles and solvent particles. Um, I like to use colored pencils with that or colored markers on the whiteboard, um, but give it a go. Could try it out, okay? Um, and then there are there are super saturated solutions. Super saturated solutions exist. So how could you get more particles dissolved in a solution than would normally be soluble at room temperature? Like, what do you think? What do you think you could do to get things super saturated, get more spaces filled than are allowed? That sounds crazy, but it's a possible. It's it's a thing. Um, it's how certain things uh, work in this world. It's how um, if you've ever put a soda in the freezer for a little bit. And then you take it out and it looks liquid and then you open the soda and then it immediately forms a slushy. If you've ever made a soda slushy that way, that's a super saturated solution. You've created a super saturated solution and now crystallizes, right? It freezes. Um, this is also if you have uh, uh, hand warmers, reusable hand warmers. If you've ever like did a little, there's a little coin in there that you could chinky. And then if you could chinky the coin, um, all of a sudden the liquid solution in there becomes a solid and it gener generates a lot of heat. And so what the heck is going on there? Well, you have a super saturated solution and then you've uh, disturbed it. And so it's crystallizing. And when it crystallizes, um, attractions are formed, crystal structures formed, and it releases heat. So how did that work? How does that happen? Okay, truth be told, I'm not positive why I put this slide in here, but I feel like I have to have the slide in here for a reason. So I think I'm going to talk about dissolving gases because solids, solids dissolving in liquids is a thing that we're very familiar with, but sol, uh, gases mixing together or gases dissolving in liquids, and we're not sure what, what's going on here. So when gases dissolve in gases, it happens spontaneously, right? Because there's so much free space that it just it just happens, right? It's not it's not um, there's no energy change in the process because it's just spontaneous. It just happens, right? Um, because there's plenty of space. However, when a gas dissolves in a liquid, now there's things that are going on here. Okay, so you have to have the same kind of thing, the same steps involved when you dissolve a gas in a liquid. Um, but the effects are different. So in when you're mixing 
a solid and a liquid or a liquid and a liquid, as the temperature increases, the uh, solvent or the solute becomes more soluble in the solvent. So the solubility increases, right? If you do that in a, in a gas and a liquid, a gas will become less soluble as the temperature increases. It is more soluble when the temperature is lower. Huh. Pressure is a factor when you're trying to dissolve a gas in a liquid. Um, it is not a factor when you're dissolving a solid in a liquid or a liquid in a liquid, right? Because they are fairly unaffected by pressure. However, gases are very affected by pressure. So what do you think is going on there? As you increase the pressure that the gas is exerting on the, the liquid, what do you think happens to the solubility of the gas? Does it increase? Does it decrease? What do you think? And then particle size. Particle size is related to the particle size of the solute, typically. So have the gas particle size. When a gas, you have large gas particles or small gas particles, which ones do you think would be more soluble in a liquid? And so here's two graphs that are showing you the effect of solubility and temperature. Notice that for most uh, ionic compounds, right, the temp as temperature increases, the solubility increases, right? There's a couple of outliers that are really weird. Uh, if you ever come across cesium uh, three sulfate solution uh, and you're supposed to make that, yeah, uh, it has to be made cold. But everything else, right, increases, the solubility increases as the temperature increases. This is because as particles are moving, moving faster, right, you're able to slide more solute particles in there because they're moving faster. And so then they can have more interactions they can move faster, have more interactions, right? And it's good. However, with a gas, the opposite is true. Okay. As the temperature increases, gases become less soluble in uh, a liquid because remember um, the randomness idea, the idea of, of gases being free, right? They like that. They like to be free, right? And so when they are moving around more, they're able to escape from the liquid and gases tend to like to escape from liquids, right? And so that's, that it has an opposite effect. Okay, and this is uh, governed by Henry's law. Henry's law describes the relationship between the solubility of a gas and uh, the pressure of the gas exerted on the container. Okay, so as you can see, um, as the pressure increases, the solubility of the gas particles increases. And so this is a very advanced equation right here. I was looking, I don't know where I found it. Um, and so uh, this, don't worry about having to remember this or having to understand this, but this is a justification of how particle size affects solubility. So intuitively we can understand that um, if you take a big rock and you try to dissolve it in water, um, it's much harder than if you crush up that rock and then you try to dissolve it in water, right? You could try this experiment at home. You could take rocks, uh, you could take um, a salt grinder, right? And take the salt crystals out of the salt grinder, dissolve those in water, and then use the grinder, dissolve your salt particles. And you'll see that as the particles get smaller or finer, it, they dissolve much faster. And this is true, uh, and it is illustrated by this equation. So S0, this is S0. I had to, it's a picture that I took, so I had to make this S0. Um, S0 is in the denominator here. That is the solubility of infinitely large particles. And then you have the solubility of the fine particles. So this is to figure out the solubility of the fine particle, right? Um, and that is a logarithmic function. Um, and it is affected by a couple of factors. These are the these are constants, so you don't have to worry about them, right? Gamma is the surface tension of the solid, so it affects uh, the the increased surface tension of the solid um, increases the solubility of its particles, right? This kind of makes sense because surface tension is related to the intermolecular forces. So the higher the intermolecular forces, the more soluble it's going to be, right? Because then it'll have more interactions with the solvent. Uh, v is the molar volume, so the larger amount of those particles, right, um, will have more solubility the more you have. This makes sense. 
R is the gas law constant, interestingly showing up in a thing that doesn't necessarily have to do with gases. T is temperature. So you notice that as temperature increases, the solubility of this gas decreases, right? And then R is the radius of the particles. So the radius, as the particles get bigger, right? They have a larger radius, their solubility decreases. Okay, so that's basically what this equation is saying. It's good to break it down. You're never actually going to have to use it though. Okay, so, so don't worry about that part. But this is like advanced level justification of uh, theory that we have in, in science. Okay, here's where we're actually going to do some, um, some math. Okay, so expressing concentrations of solutions. Molarity is the one that you're familiar with. This is the one we use in chemistry all the time. Moles rule, so this is a ruling. This is a really important one, all right? Mole fraction is a, a, a new one. Mole fraction is really useful as a um, conversion tool. So you can convert from the moles of one thing to the moles of another thing in a mixture based upon its mole fraction, or you can convert pressure units or volume units or another kind of units because you have this ratio of moles that you can multiply by anything. And then it, it gives you, converts that into the moles of the thing that you're worried about. Okay. And then molality. So this is a scripted M. It's usually uppercase, but I guess this is lowercase. I don't know. A scripted M is standing for molality, okay, molality. And this is used in freezing point depression and boiling point elevation calculations, where you have the moles of the solvent per kilogram of solvent. Um, it's, a, it's an odd unit, right? But it's used specifically for only uh, freezing point depression and boiling point elevation calculations. But that's what this chapter is about. So I included that, um, that unit in here. So colligative properties are properties that depend upon the amount of particles. Solubility is one of them and boiling point elevation and freezing point depression is another one. So the boiling point of a pure liquid will be elevated by adding a solvent or a solute to it. Okay. So you add solute particles and that increases the temperature that you need to get it to in order to make that mixture boil. Okay. This should make kind of kind of makes sense because if you add particles to the solution those particles have increased attractions for each other you know the the intermolecular forces and so the more attractions give you um, more forces that you have to overcome in order to boil that liquid right so that should make sense and this is given by the molality of the solution times this k constant of boiling this K constant of boiling is particular to a, um, a substance, and it also depends upon the number of particles. So there should be another factor here. You always have to multiply by the number of particles that you have in your solution. So you have the whatever the solute is, however many particles that solute contributes to the solution. Okay, And then this is true in the opposite direction for freezing point, you have to use more energy, you have to remove more energy from a solution in order to freeze it. Um, and this should make sense as well because you have the attractions of the uh, solute and the solvent, right? And in order to freeze the substance, those interactions have to stop moving, right? And so you have to get them to chill out <laughs> and it takes, you have to take more energy away. Right. Um, and so adding salt to ice will lower its freezing point. Right. And then make it a liquid at low at high, lower temperatures. And we use this to keep the roads uh, wet and not icy in the wintertime. Right. Um, and that, that's kind of a key key thing to understand. Um, here's some resources that I have to check out, not necessarily you. So. Um, you feel free to, if you want to, but uh, you don't have to. Um, this is just the end of the slideshow. So um, this is, I just put this at the end. All right. So have a great day.